Now this tonight will be our last lesson in the book of Philemon. And I wanted to give a, a word about what prompts me to teach what I teach. <laughs> There's reasons. It's, it's more than I've been impressed with a certain thing. That, that's not the thing that drives my mm -hmm. preaching and teaching. I felt that Philemon introduced uh, a, 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 uh, an idea, perception, that needs to be developed more fully. That, namely that the, when you're in Christ Jesus, there is a very personal aspect to it. And faith does penetrate into the personal lives of people mm -hmm. and that there is a way that people's personal lives can be integrated mm -hmm. and it, it sort of illustrates it. This book illustrates that truth mm -hmm. and uh, I say there's a need for it because there's, there's a temptation for people to like thrust their personal lives off to the side as though they, they, they were of no consequence but this, you couldn't ask for anything. The circumstance that drove Philemon was actually not a kingdom type circumstance. It was a personal mm -hmm. thing. A man's personal slave ran away. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet he integrates faith with that yeah. Amen. and brotherhood yeah. with that circumstance. And that the genius of it is the thing that intrigues me and I that I think was necessary to be uh, to be taught. Now, our next uh, next time we meet, we're going to commence the book of Hosea. It's not just that Hosea is an interesting book. I want really I want to emphasize that, particularly if you're a preacher or a teacher, you're not to be up here just telling what you like and what you're interested in, what's captured your attention. Believe me when I tell you, this is not the role of a preacher and teacher. You're you're to administer things that are pertinent. Yeah. that bear on where we're at either by foundation mm -hmm. or by application. Mm -hmm. Now the book of Hosea suits our time mm -hmm. because the state of the church today is the same as the state of Israel was in the time of Hosea. Mm -hmm. But people take it too casually. Mm -hmm. This situation is grievous to God, not grievous like make mad, grievous like a heart breaks. Amen. Yeah. And I see a need for this, to, for people to actually be grieved yeah. and hurt by the state of things. Now God taught Hosea how he felt yeah. by leading him to marry a harlot. Then to go buy her back when she ran away. Yeah. That's how sensitive a matter Israel wandering from God was. That's how sensitive it was to God. Yeah, yeah. So that anyway, that's why I chose that book because I think we're in we're in a parallel yeah. situation, and it's important that we have the right reaction to it. That it not just be indignation, although we'll have that. God was indignant too, you know. Yeah. But there's a there's a heart reaction to it that I'm mm -hmm. seeking for myself and for others. So we'll be at the book of Hosea <clears throat> tonight. We'll uh, we'll go over the 22nd to the 25th verses. Now, as I mentioned to you already, the book of Philemon introduces different facets of spiritual life. Facets say they aren't like obvious. To everybody, there are some people that would never have got involved with Philemon, even if they knew what had happened. They had never injected themselves into the situation. They said, well, "That's Philemon's business. That's none of my business. We should stay out of each other's business. Every man should bear his own burden." There's a lot of things, but that's not what Paul did. Personal life in the flesh is woven together with the life that's in Christ Jesus. From the standpoint of uh, priority, they're, they're separate. Yeah. So there's a sense in which they're absolutely separate. But salvation is calculated to do this. This is what salvation, one of the things salvation is calculated to do. 
the preeminent thing, of course, is reconciliation to God and access to God and fellowship with Christ. That's the preeminent thing. But salvation is calculated to integrate with the most terrible details of life. It's made to do that. That's what salvation does. Mm -hmm. There's no other way you could, your life, your body could be a living sacrifice. See, if that wasn't true, you, there's no way you, you, your life could be a sacrifice to God. Yeah. Your total life a sacrifice to God. Amen. Your work life, your married life, your personal life, every facet of it has to do with life with God. And this book has illustrated that for us. There's, there's limitations to this, of course. You, you, you can take the thing too far, and you could accent earthly relationships above spiritual ones, which is being done in our day. That's not right. They, it's, it, but they've got to be integrated. Yeah. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, yeah. see. Philemon uh, could not Paul could not address, Philemon could not address the situation with Onesimus in isolation of his faith. His faith had to be brought into this, and that's the role that Paul is playing. And you'll notice also that while his situation was separate from newness of life, newness of life had to govern we you, you got to really see this. It's, um, uh, it's not easy to explain, but I, I have confidence you know what I mean. That Your life in Christ had to superintend your life in the world. Yes. Yes. It has to be on the throne. Yes. See, we have, we're living in a world when the, where the, the other life superintends spiritual life, so people defer yeah. to life in the flesh. They defer to that. But the proper posture is to defer to life in Christ, which means it governs the earthly relationships, whether you're a husband or a wife or a father or a child or an employee or an employer or whatever, a citizen or a president, whatever. The life you have in Christ Jesus has to be the dominant and governing factor. Brother, isn't that what Paul meant when he said to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. That's you know, right. I live, Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's what he was talking about. Exactly right. Life in the flesh is just what we call everyday life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So you can't wait to heaven to apply these. Yeah. Uh -huh. To apply these things. Now, additionally, what takes place in the... Uh, among the members of the body of Christ is, is personal and it's extensive. Now in this text, for instance, we have a master, a slave, and an apostle. <laughs> it's, it's joined together about a certain specific situation in the flesh. And Paul is promoting this uh, correct association of an apostle, a master, and a slave about this situation. There to be every one mind and be in unanimity about it. In other words, this is what unity of the faith, unity of the spirit, this is how it fleshes out. Yeah, that's right. It isn't just that we all have the same theology. Yeah. Although that's necessary. That's necessary. Or that we, have, we understand the scriptures alike. That's, that's necessary. But we we must come to the point where we can see life alike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. And if we got an Onesimus on our hand, mm -hmm. there's not five different ways to address it. Yeah. You're seeing that in this book, see. Over and above us, we, we personally profit. That's how we personally profit from this book. This book, well, you've learned it by experience, haven't you already? This this book has profited you personally, even though it involved the personal affairs of someone that lived a couple thousand years ago. How's that? But more than that, it has impacted over this 2,000 years. This epistle has impacted thousands, millions of lives because Paul wrote down things that told you, listen, life in Christ is very practical. Yes. 
it touches every aspect of your life. Yeah. So if yeah, when anybody reads this, they shouldn't have to ask, them, well, what does this mean to me? That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a parent with some challenges or a married couple with some challenges or you got employment challenges or you know, et cetera, et cetera, never health situations, never try and address them independently of your faith. Yes, amen. At no point can you step out of the role yes. of a child of God right. and address life. Yes. That's, that's the point. Alright, here's a verses 22 through 25. But with all, prepare me also a lodging. For I trust through your prayers, I shall be given to you, unto you. There salute thee, we might say there are here, who salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That's a, that's a personal letter. That's the end of a personal letter. <laughs> Let's look at this word, with all. It's a good word, isn't it? Some, some versions don't use it. With all. You might be surprised what it means. So the New King James Version reads, Meanwhile, there's all these things I've been talking about while you're addressing that. Meanwhile, New American Standard Bible says, now at the same time, all these things I've been talking to you about, receive them on SMS, and you might receive them forever, and receive them as a brother, and receive them like me, and refresh my bowels. I don't throw, throw this in there, too. This, this, and one thing more, the New International Version says, and Montgomery's Version says, oh, yes. And also, but the, what he says here doesn't sound like it integrates very well. Prepare a lodging for me? How does that exactly, how does that fit in what we've been talking about? Well, it does. It fits in. And Phyllis' version says, oh, do something else. Now, the word translated with all, with all, means at the same time at once together, together with, so you couldn't merge. <laughs> This is living by faith. This, you were, this is an example of living by faith. Mm -hmm. Now some people, they, they do real well till a challenge comes up. Mm -hmm. A thorn. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, whoop, they step out of the role of faith. Yes. Oh, it's a... It's a, <laughs> it's a good thing you made this hand for me. <laughs> this, there are two... <laughs> views of this uh, the way that people tend to think now is if they're if they're being very spiritual they're they're thinking about imposing a, a spiritual template if you will over their circumstances mm -hmm. and now what Paul is doing is he's actually living yeah. in Christ Jesus is it's not like he's taking something and saying, "Okay, well now look, we're gonna we're gonna bring that over here, and we're going to add this to what we're doing, or we're going to let that be our our template in this kind of circumstance." He's saying, "No, you aren't what you were anymore. You have mm -hmm. to see yourself primarily the way God looks at yeah. you, mm -hmm. and His brethren the way God views them, and you have to to actually." Uh, have dominion over the circumstances of this life because you are alive to God. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a different it's a different perspective. It isn't we're just inviting God into our That's lives right. Amen. and trying to control the circumstance in a way that would please him. We're actually abiding in him. Mm -hmm. And our mind is actually the mind of Christ on these things. Mm -hmm. So that whenever <clears throat> Paul looked at Onesimus and Paul looked at Philemon, he didn't 
he he knew the circumstances, mm -hmm. but he didn't see them primarily as slave and master. Mm -hmm. He saw them primarily as brethren and yeah. servants mm -hmm. of God. Yeah. You might think of uh, different aspects of life or circumstances of life as a hand. It'd be the, the marital hand and the servant hand and the master's hand and so forth. The glove of salvation fits on them all. That's how you have to think about this. The glove of salvation fits on whatever circumstance there is. Whether it's Philemon or Onesimus, or whether it's handling a fornicator at Corinth, or whether it's instructing slaves on how they should conduct themselves, or masters how they should conduct themselves, or what, or husbands, or what, whatever, the glove of salvation fits on there. But now, I'm disappointed to have to say this, but I'm afraid there's a lot of people that never associate the challenges and difficulties and hardships they face with salvation. They never make that that connection and that that circumstance is what makes those times so difficult yeah, because he got go ahead brother Tony I was going to say you know when Paul put on that glove and he had dressed marriage problems for example in Corinthians they, they should have been able to put on the glove themselves that's right and address exactly issues right too, because they they had access to that. but Paul he had to deal with it and he did uh, he did write in every epistle write that yeah because he expected people to like pick up on this. So when when life becomes hard, and if it hasn't yet, it will. <laughs> when life becomes hard, flee for refuge to Christ. Don't sit down and try and figure it out. Amen. Yes. Yeah. See, that's a temptation to sit down and try and try and figure it out, and. I don't say that to condemn anybody because I've been there and everybody here probably has been there. You had to learn uh, learned it. No. In salvation, he makes you so you will flee to God for refuge, flee to Christ for refuge, whatever the situation is. Amen. Not only in a religious situation or a death-threatening situation, but any situation. Yeah. Yeah. You flee to him, and that's exactly what he's teaching. Philemon, yes. You said at the beginning that uh, you have to learn to apply these things now, and not wait till heaven. It made me think, why would you want to wait? That's right. Why wouldn't you want to go ahead and, and apply this? That's now? right. Amen. It's the it's the use of the things of God. I say it's the use of them that prepares you for heaven. Go ahead, brother. Well, isn't that the, the Lord's design? Is that it? Yes. That there be a certain difficulty and hardness associated with this so that you would be encouraged to flee. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when Peter's walking on water and he begins to sink, he knows he's not going to cry out to some man to help him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. He's not going to turn to some man and ask for help. He knows yeah. where right. to turn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, some people would cry today for a lifesaver. Oh, yeah. yeah. They'd look to see if there's any other boats in the water. Oh, right. See if someone could risk. To this point, now he said, with all, that it's in addition to everything else I've told you. So here's what he told him so far. Receive Onesimus as you would receive, as he would receive Paul. If Onesimus had wronged him, or owed him anything, put it on Paul's account. Paul asked for him to refresh his bowels in the Lord. And now he says, and oh yes, one other thing. <laughs> But what he says on the surface doesn't look like it like it fits in with that sort of thing, but it does. Yeah. Does fit in. So we're being exposed to the nature of spiritual life. See, that's what this is. The nature of spiritual life is it pervades the whole of man's activity. Yeah. Not just part of it. And it's commonly it's thought that it's just part of it. So we have the religious and the secular, yeah. the spiritual and the carnal. Right. But all of these, by carnal I mean natural, mm -hmm. all the natural associations 
and experiences of life are under the superintendence Amen. of the new man. Amen. For example, and he taught the he taught Israel as he taught this, but he had to teach it to them by rote because see they didn't have new hearts, they, they didn't have a, a conscience that was alive toward God. So he taught things by rote. You need rest. Sabbath days imposed on them. See? <laughs> you have to be able to uh, discern good and evil. So I'm going to define clean, unclean. I'm going to teach you by... This was their religion that required this. Understand. This was not health. Uh -huh. That's right. We got a new breed of Christian doctors today that look in Deuteronomy and tell you that it's for your health. Well, these men, these are false prophets. This is Amen. not so. That's right. Amen. So they say it's God prohibited swine's flesh because and on and on and on. This is not so. He was teaching the people by rote mm -hmm. what you know in Christ by nature that your religion has to be woven into your everyday life. Amen. Amen. So he forced it by Richard, you have a feast, it had to be a religious feast. Uh -huh. <laughs> there were no rules about a picnic and what to do at a picnic. It was a religious. You, you, you teach them, you've got to bring God into every. Yes, amen. If you're plowing your field, you put God in it. If you're sewing a garment, you put God in it. And he told them how to make clothes. Yeah. Right. Not because he was instructing the human race on how to make clothes. Uh -huh. He told him when to mu not to muzzle the mouth of the ox at treading out the corn. Let the ox eat. He wasn't. It wasn't that he was a teaching animal rights. He was teaching you've got to be considered about God in everything you do. So he taught them by rote and by rules. Whatever, uh, whatever a person does that isn't connected with God, that will be the exact thing that Satan uses to yeah. get it That's right. into them. Yeah. That's right. See, he taught people, like for instance, you want to teach people that whoever serves God has to do it all the time. Yes. Yeah, so they can't do it some of the time. So he picks out a special tribe who serves God. Uh -huh. And they do that all the time. Uh -huh. They don't have any possessions in the world. See, he was teaching Israel what actually is taught in Philemon. He was teaching Israel, but he was doing it by, by rope. But because they were hard-hearted, it had to be with rules and yeah. regulations. Line That's line on line, precept upon precept. That's exactly right. But in Christ, now there's a change in character that takes place. And a change of life that takes place. And now a person can be taught differently than by rote. Amen. Believers are not to be taught like little children are taught. About how to wash your hands and all that, how to add and all that. This is not how believers are to be taught. Their situation is different. The reason you teach children that way is because they have a nature that's against that. They, they won't do that by nature. If you say, don't run in the street, their nature is running in the street because they don't know about trucks and cars and all this. They don't know about that. Yeah. But when they know about it, you don't have to, you know, when you send your 21-year-old boy out to work, you don't say, no, what, don't, don't walk travel in the street now and someone's coming. Look both ways. And But Israel... That's why they were taught. You got to see this law. Law is because of an unlearned and a situation, and so you have to embed the embed it in procedures to force them to think about. It. Now they they're not going to rest unless you like make it a you make a penalty of death if you don't. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> they, they just wouldn't do it. They thought seven days you make more, you know. Well, you can see. No, we won't have to dwell on that anymore. But with all, you couldn't say with all under the law. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because they couldn't make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't say, and with all, by the way, don't forget when you make your clothes to make them right. You know? he, couldn't see, he couldn't speak like that to them, but he can to you. Mm -hmm. Amen. You can say with all, while you're doing all this other, mm -hmm. while you're doing these spiritual things, feeding your soul, 
pressing toward the mark, fighting the good fight of faith, resisting the devil, and so forth. While you're doing all that, Philemon, don't forget to make a place for me to stay. How's that for a quantum leap? Prepare for me also a lodging. Yeah, it sounds like it's of a different, a different order. And if it wasn't for the fact that it involved believers, it would be of a different order. But when there's, when you're a believer, there's only one order. Amen. <laughs> it's only one order. Prepare for me, prepare me also a lodging. Some of the other versions say prepare a guest room, <laughs> make a room ready for me, prepare a place for me to stay, provide accommodation for me. See, in our society, did people be afraid to say something like this? Oh, by the way, you have a place for me to stay and I get there. Yeah. But I tell you, if he said, Paul said that to the church, he said, well, what are you talking about? We've got our own life. We have a small house. Yeah. <clears throat> think, you think none of these people had small houses? <laughs> See, I'm showing you that when you have life in Christ Jesus, it's just different than life in the world. Prepare a lodging for me. So is hospitality to me. See, those in Christ are admonished, and I won't go into all it takes to be hospitable. This is a matter of spiritual life. Hospitality. This means awesome. you don't know who the person is. It means that kind of thing. It isn't always someone you know. Be hospitable to strangers. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels. So that person, that's, that may be an angel <laughs> you're talking to. Hospitality. Now the significance of hospitality is seen in what Jesus has said about how one person treats another person that's God's child. Now we're talking particularly about that. He says, now he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Whoo! <laughs> what? He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Well, that opens a lot of possibilities now. And if a righteous and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, that is you receive him because he's a righteous man. He shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now this is the king said this. This is the Lord of glory said this. You see a person is a prophet. So you receive him. Not because he's your friend. and Not because he's in need. But because he's a prophet. Yeah. Uh -huh. God says I'll give you a prophet's reward. And that's what it says. Yes. And you see a righteous man. He's holy before the God, God. He's dedicated to the Lord. You know he is, so you receive him. You don't receive him because he's your friend or because he's nice or because you get along. You receive him because he's a righteous man. Jesus said you'll receive a righteous man's reward. That's right. All right, now you take the case of Philemon or Onesimus. Oh, this tra now this transforms the whole whole thing. If you look at Philemon, you receive Onesimus as a righteous man. I'll give you righteous man's reward. Onesimus, you receive Philemon as a righteous man. I'll give you a see. Changes the whole, the whole thing. And Jesus said, whosoever shall give to one of these little ones a cup of cold water. That's about as, about as low a level as you can get. A cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. In the name of a disciple, I'm doing this because I'm a follower of Christ. That's why I'm doing it. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. There's rewards for that. Yes. Now you want to move that over into this case of Philemon and see what's, yeah. what's accruing. Rewards are accruing. You may also require recall that the early church supported widows, mm -hmm. but they couldn't just support like any Christian widow. Uh -huh. yeah. yep. was very, they, had to, they had to be 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Said if they're younger than that, let them marry. Yeah, right. Said I don't want to get married, then don't gripe about not having anything. Uh -huh. yes. Let them marry. 
60 years old and if they are have been hus if they've entertained strangers and washed the saints feet say well they weren't hospitable sorry say we need some extra money for bread sorry this is what he said first Timothy 5 days this is what he said that's how important hospitality is. Yes. So if you're hospitable, it's going to affect your life way down the road somewhere. Yes. Amen. You're going to have a need to have some hospitality yourself. Amen. Extend it toward you. So see, this is good. I say this because it's not popular to be hospitable. We, when we first came to Joppa and we realized that this, this is not a hospitable uh, it isn't that people are hard. That's not that they haven't been taught about this or something. That is strange. And when we used to have the renewals at different churches all the time, this was singularly the most difficult thing wow. was to find someone who'd house the people. Uh -huh. There was always this, there was always a, some choice ones that did. Some people, but well, we used to do this. But we didn't have much. We would. The mother and father would give up their bedroom to the guest and we'd sleep on the floor or something. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We're hospitable to brethren. He's telling Philemon, make a place for me. Be hospitable. Uh -huh. He knows he's going to, uh, so Philemon's going to understand this, see. Now, we're, understand, we're not trying to make laws here because they've done been made. Yeah. The law's already been made. <laughs> Show hospitality. That's right. Don't be, don't forget mm -hmm. to entertain strangers. Don't forget mm -hmm. to entertain the brethren. Don't forget that. Why? Because your life, that's one part of life that your faith is poured into that part of your life. See? Now he says, I, I'm going to be coming pretty soon. I trust, I trust that I will. I trust that through your prayers, now this is Paul coming to visit Philemon, who was presently, Paul's in prison. He's looking forward to getting released and come to visit Philemon, and he says, through your prayers. <laughs> is that good? Through your prayers, Judah. Before you get too far off this point of hospitality, I'm reminded of this, the scripture that says, if you've done it to the least of these, then you've done it to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus said. So this level of hospitality, giving a cup of cold water, the saints in his name, and being hospitable, or being hospitable, that dictates what we do to Christ. That's right. So our level of hospitality is exactly how we'll treat Christ. So that's that gives a new dimension on how we Amen. Saints. Now I do want to say this that you brethren have been very, very good to Sister June and I. And believe me when I say we have not overlooked it. You have helped us when we needed help, and we and I wasn't accustomed to needing help. <laughs> but but there come that time when you were mindful of us and we took note of it and but more than that, God took note of it. God is not unrighteous to forget your work of faith and labor of love. Okay. See, that, that was, that's part of it. I trust I'll be with you out by your prayers. And a weapon of all prayer. Remember he said, praying always with all prayer for all saints everywhere. Through your prayers. Now, between you got to kind of read between the lines. It is Satan's going to try and stop this from happening, Philemon. Satan knows if you and I get together, it's going to have a kingdom, Im yeah. kingdom impact. So now Satan's going to try and stop this. So now through your prayers, God will bring me to you. Amen. You see how, how practical that is? Amen. It wasn't just, I'll come to you. He said, I shall be given to you. See, all right, now that puts another, that puts another view on this thing of visiting. Yeah. Amen. There are some people God will give you. Yeah, right. He'll just give you. Mm -hmm. He'll put them in your life because they bring an advantage to you. And when they do, you've got to see it this way. Yes. God gave them to you. Amen. 
I made that through prayer, but he he gave them to you. I'll be given to you through your prayer. Amen. There are some people whose presence is traced back to God. Yes. There's some people whose presence is traced back to Satan. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. But there are some people that have been introduced in, in your life mm -hmm. that God put there. Yes. He's, he gave those people to you. Mm -hmm. In fact, those when you believed, when you believed, you believed because God gave you somebody. Yeah, that's right. Who are Paul and Apollos, but men by whom you believe, whom God has given to every man, he given. He, the person who, through whom you believed, was actually given to you. Yes. Amen. That person was given to you. So no matter how long ago it was, it's always in order to give thanks. Give thanks. Amen. There are some people I just thank God they came into my life. Almost all of the epochs in my life were attended by some choice person that came into my life. Maybe they led me to see it. Maybe they provided an environment for me to see it. Maybe they made me more sensitive to I need to see it. But that God, they were set yes. into our lives. To so such people that bring benefits to us, they're God's employees. Right. He sent them out. Uh -huh. I know that there's some you say, now look, son so and so, there's some brethren down there in Joplin. I want you to I want you to go down there and and visit them. Yeah. So here sometimes we've had someone turned up in our assembly. Uh -huh. a, pro a profitable brother. What was it? He was sent. Yes, amen. Sometimes it was for their benefit, sometimes for our benefit, but he was sent. Yeah. Sent. Given you mentioned this, this last week about an angel um, yeah. being a messenger, you know, I mean, you can see that that um, a lot of times you, you you've met and you fellowship with someone yeah. and you didn't know that they were a saint until later. You yes. thought about the things that happened, the things they said, yeah. and it, you know, it, it, I was thinking about that. This is more often than I've known yeah. that I've entertained angels unaware, unaware. Things, things that God sent to me, That's people right. who sent well, to do a specific work in me. Yeah. But I, you know, it, it, anyway, it, it's it's very. Uh, I, I I was very blessed by that thought that um, if God can can affect your life, he he doesn't need your approval. He sends what you need. That's right. In order to get a result or effect. See, if you, you if a person wasn't hospitable, he'd miss this. That's right. Amen. Yeah. He'd miss it. Say, well, not now. This is not the time to come. You better. Mm -hmm. Now, you may remember that Moses was sent to the Israelites uh -huh. yeah. and Jonah was sent to Nineveh and Paul was sent to Macedonia it's, 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 it's in scripture it's all woven in there all through the yeah. God he's in his kingdom now and his yeah. kingdom subjects yeah. he's sending, dispatching yeah. how shall they preach except they be sent yes. so I said well Philemon through your prayer I'm trust I'm dependent on this here in prison I'm dependent on this I look at these four walls here and I look at this chain and I'm not like encouraged at all I'm going to be out of here pretty soon that I'm thinking about your prayers Philemon that you're praying for me and I'll be given to you pretty soon now, now this was done in addition to all the other things he told us, he blended, how he blended everything yeah. together. Then he brings something else, he brings some other people, some other personalities into this. He says, there, salute thee. There's, he's talking about people who are with him. There are, there are some here. Mm -hmm. I salute you, but there are some additional brethren that salute you. Salute thee, mean greet you or sends greetings to you, or wishes to be remembered by you, one version says. This is the impact of unity of the faith. See, faith reaches over geographical boundaries, <clears throat> greets the person way over there. <laughs> they don't have access to them at all. Greets them. This is a congenial greeting in the name of the Lord, a greeting, that kind of greeting. Now, Epaphras, Epaphras greets you. 
quite a blessing to have your name mentioned in Scripture, you know. Epaphras, particularly sends his greetings. He's in prison. He's a fellow prisoner. He's a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Some versions say he's in prison with me for the cause of Christ. New Jerusalem Bible says he's a prisoner with me in Christ Jesus. One version says he's in prison with me for the cause of Christ. A prisoner with me. A fellow captive in Christ. The Living Bible says my cellmate. <laughs> Yeah, maybe he was. I don't know yeah. if he was. Maybe he had him in the same cell or not, but that sure would have been a blessing, wouldn't it? Now, Paul Epaphras, he mentions his, this man in his epistle to the Colossians, which we understand was written some time before this. There we learn in Colossians 1-7 that he was a faithful minister for the Colossians who probably met in Philemon's house. So he was a faithful minister, but he'd been he was in prison now. Long way away. He wrote that Epaphras was actually ministering to Paul in the behalf of the Colossians and those with Philemon. So on behalf of them, they would have all come and ministered themselves. But instead Epaphras is ministering to them, to Paul. I don't know how it was, but it was probably a lot of a lot of practical things as well as spiritual matters. Ministered to Paul, and he, Paul says about him, now "This man is a prayer. This Epaphras, he's in prison with Paul. He's thinking about the brethren back home, and here's what he says. Paul said of him, he's always laboring fervently for you in prayers." that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Why is he doing that? Well, the church at Colossae, we had been exposed to some philosophical teaching that was luring them away from Christ. And Paul wrote his epistle about this and mentioned it to them. So while he's writing, to the Colossians, straightening them out. Epaphras is to pray it for them to be straightened out. I'm, Epaphras is praying you'd stand, not not down, not laying down, not sleeping. You'll stand perfect or mature, grown up, in, in, in complete in all the will of God. <coughs> Have you ever prayed that for someone? You. He actually prayed, Lord, I'm asking you to help them to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. See, there's some people that need to have that prayed for them because they're they're like yeah. waffling a little bit. They haven't they haven't departed from the faith, but they're being subjected to influences that they're waffling a little bit. All right, now how comes a prayer weapon all prayer? Gotta bring this all prayer in here. Pray they stand. <laughs> Perfect and complete. Why? Because this is what God wants. This is what salvation is calculated to do. So now Epaphras, he sends greetings to them. The same one's praying for him. He sends greetings to them. And uh, maybe he saw Paul writing in the prison. What are you doing, Brother Paul? I'm writing to the Colossians here. Uh, greet them for me. Send them greetings for me. Tell them I'm thinking about them. I thank God for them. And uh, Marcus. Marcus, that's the transliteration of the word Mark. That's the Greek version of Mark. Mark. He sends greetings. This is the son of Mary, the woman at whose house the believers were praying when Peter was released from prison. This is her son. In that report in Acts 12, we learn a little something about Mark, also called John Mark. And when Peter had considered the thing, how he had been delivered from prison, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together. So you hear people refer to John Mark? That's, that's what they're talking about. 
Mark, his surname of the one that came first was was John. John Mark. Later, Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas, and he, he left the work. Right, right in the middle of it, he went back to Jerusalem. Commenting on it, Paul said uh, he departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. The work. That's the work that God had sent them to. Mm -hmm. Well, it got down to the work. Yeah. Mark got off. Went back home. And uh, Paul refused to take him on any other trips at that point. And Barnabas, he disagreed with him and the contention was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas split up mm -hmm. over that matter. And Barnabas took Mark with him, and Paul took Silas, and we don't read about either Barnabas or Mark anymore in the book of Acts. And that was Acts 13. That was the last you read about Barnabas and Mark. But Mark later, he returned, evidently, and recouped from that setback. And Paul wrote to Timothy, he asked Timothy to come to him, and he... He said, uh, bring Mark also, for he's profitable to me in the ministry. So now, before he was a deterrent, yeah, uh -huh, he, yeah. now he's profitable. Amen. And he's with the Mark. So Mark, he sends his greetings mm -hmm. to them. Aristarchus, he sent his greetings. Aristarchus was a man from Macedonia. He has one of Paul's companions in travel. That direct quote from Acts 19.29. You're one of his companions in travel. So when Paul traveled en route to Rome, he had a cluster of brethren with him, and our Aristarchus was one of them. The scriptures tell us he accompanied Paul into Asia, Acts 20 and verse 4. And he could well have been in the ship that was shipwrecked on the Isle of Melita. Because he was he come down about that time. So he might very well have been in that ship. When writing Colossians, Paul refers to him as a fellow prisoner. So he was in he was in prison too. And then at Demas, he sent greetings. Demas, he was with Paul when he wrote the book of Colossians, Colossians 4.14. And later when Paul was nearing his death, the time he said, I fought a good fight, I'm ready to be offered, fought a good fight kept the faith. About that time, Demas left him, mm -hmm. forsook him, mm -hmm. having loved more of this present world. But at the time of this writing, Demas said uh, he was with him. And Lucas, Lucas is the transliteration of the word Luke. It's a Greek form of Luke. This is the Luke that wrote the book of Acts, the, book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Luke traveled extensively with Paul. Probably was involved in most of those shipwrecks and things. Paul referred to him as the beloved physician. Maybe he attended to some of the things that were a result of Paul's thorn in the flesh. We don't know, but he was a beloved physician. We assume that Paul, that uh, Luke, he had a disciplined mind and possibly more education than the average person being a physician. But he gave his physicianhood yeah. to Christ. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I could do, I'd be doing better now to travel with Paul, yeah. be a minister to him, than to build my private practice. These kind of people, these are the kind of people now that mm -hmm. were with Paul when he wrote. He calls it my fellow laborers, my fellow workers. We're all working on the same project. Mm -hmm. These brethren were not, in, were not engaged, were not only engaged in the same work Paul was doing, their labors complemented yeah. Paul's labors. That's right. And Paul's labors complemented or enhanced mm -hmm. their labors. Amen. So they send their they send their greetings to you. See, this is a family, Paul. It's a, a Philemon. This, this isn't just you and me and Onesimus. Yeah. It's you and me and Onesimus and Epaphras and Aristarchus and Mark and Luke. It's all us, all of us involved in this. And he closes out the letter. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, grace is associated with the entire Godhead. We read of the grace of God at least 24 times. There's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as mentioned 10 times. Once we read of the grace of Christ, and we also read of the grace of the Spirit. <laughs> so there you have the entire, mm -hmm. the entire Godhead yeah, amen. is characterized by grace. Now here's the way it works: grace comes from God. He's the original. Comes from God mm -hmm. through Christ, who administers it, yeah. and the Spirit effectualizes it. That's yeah, right. Amen. amen. Or makes it work. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, the entire Godhead is involved. Mm -hmm. So doctrinally, the grace of God has to do with its origin. Mm -hmm. God is the fountain, in other words, from which it emanates. The grace of Jesus Christ focuses on the means through which the grace is delivered and maintained. And the spirit of grace refers to the enlivening effects. <clears throat> of grace. So if you wondered why grace is so effective, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's why the whole Godhead's involved in it. Amen. Grace, you remember, brings salvation, yeah. which means God sent it, mm -hmm. Jesus administers it, yeah. the Holy Spirit makes it effective. Yeah. See? When the early church prayed effectively and the apostles gave witness to the resurrection, it says, great grace. Yeah was upon them all. See, I covered that for us to have great grace. Yes, you know, may our assemblies have great grace. Yes, amen. Now, what is great grace? It's when the favor of God is like the dominant consideration. Uh -huh. The fact that God is good, God is gracious, God is kind, God is... When that, when that all rises to the surface and you, you are str struck mm -hmm. with the magnitude of God's goodness and His favor, that's when the grace of... That's great grace. Amen is upon the people. There are times like that, aren't there? When, when you are just especially aware of the magnitude of God's grace. Amen. Great grace was upon you. Peter boldly announced, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. That was, that was his, his perception. So he knew about this, this grace. Apollos, you'll remember, he, he helped them much who had believed through grace. Remember, he said, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with, you, be with your spirit. So these things, will, that would highlight all of these things we're talking about. The gospel is called the gospel of the grace of God. It's good news. See, I, I regret to say that I've heard a lot of preaching that you, you would never have known there was such a thing as grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just wasn't brought up very much. And believers are told we have access into this faith wherein we stand by grace. We have access to this faith, by faith, into this grace wherein we stand. So your faith gives you access to the grace which is this stabilizing factor in the kingdom of God. Believers are taught, now sin will not have dominion over you. Because you're not under law, you're under grace. See, so our sin is dominating people. The issue is that you need grace. The issue is you're under the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're not under law. We're under grace. It's been sin, sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Because yes. you're not under law. Yeah. You're under grace. So the law strengthens sin. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Yeah. Grace dominates. Amen. That's why you've got to preach the grace of God. That's why this is necessary. It also highlights the severity of the statement that where Stephen said you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. You're stopping up the well of That's grace. Right. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> the throne administering the kingdom on which Jesus sits is called a throne of grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where it's dispensed. Now, what I'm establishing here is that where proper preaching and teaching is done, 
an environment or a culture is created in which grace can work. You can say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's only said to people in a certain kind of environment. You don't say this to people in the bar. You don't shout in the door, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. <laughs> this is not this environment. Yeah, that's right. It's an environment that where the fellow ground has been broke up and where people are living unto the Lord. Where hearts are tender. See, the modern church, it's not ready for grace. Yeah, that's right. I, hate to, I hate to say that, but that's the truth. It's not ready for grace. Uh -huh. yep. It's got to know how it's bad its situation is. Uh -huh. it, it, it's not aware of the fact it needs grace yet. Notice what he says about grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now that phrase is mentioned elsewhere. Galatians 6.18 says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There it is again. Be with your spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. 2 Timothy 4.22 says. Well, what does it mean? The grace of God be with your spirit. The spirit of man is an unseen. It's an unseen part. Yet it's one in which men are to glorify God. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, mm -hmm. which are God's. They belong to God, in other words. How do you glorify God in your spirit? That's, that's the engine of your, of your person. The vehicle of your person is driven by the engine of your spirit. If your spirit is dead, you're living a dead life. You're dead while you live. If your spirit's alive, it spills over into everything everything you do. That is, you God wants you to be sanctified or set apart spirit in order of priority, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit's the essential you, the thing that drives everything. The soul is the expressive part of you, and the body is the thing you have to make do the will of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the body, your body's like an automobile. Anybody can drive it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Satan can drive it. Holy Spirit can drive it. Mm -hmm. It's just a vehicle to be driven. A ball goes right to the root of the matter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Mm -hmm. you know, are you in tune with your spirit? Do you feel as though you're in tune with your spirit? Spirit, you've grown and you kind of sense what what you really are inside. Your spirit. Grace of God, Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. Amen. See that you couldn't you couldn't have a more central, fundamental part than that. Not the not the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your hand, or with your mind, with your arm. <laughs> but sometimes people think of grace that way. They think of grace just a, this, just, just a little, mm -hmm. I need it here in this little area here. No, you need it in your spirit. Amen. Right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's the one administering the grace? He's the one that actually delivers it. God's the one that gives it, see. Be with your spirit. Now, I'm, I'm persuaded that most professing Christians do not take good care of their spirits. They're a little lax. They're too distracted. They're too diverted to other things that require a significant investment of the mind and the heart and so forth. And so it bleeds off the strength from their spirit. So in your spirit, that's what makes, makes you do what you do. It makes you say what you say. It makes you be what you are. Your spirit. And if your spirit is weak, your, your doing is weak. Your words are weak. Everything about you is weak. So Paul, he prays this. A spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You know the last words, what the last words in the Bible are? After everything has been said and done, the last words in the Bible. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 <laughs> is that... Yeah. That's how important grace is. See, that's how important grace is. Amen. As soon as your spirit becomes deficient or weak, you're rendered incapable of doing the will of God. Mm -hmm. Your spirit's got to be strong. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I would admonish you to culture your spirit. Amen. Get the right things into it. Mm -hmm. Now, what you, what you funnel into your mind, eventually that'll drop down into your spirit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so you want it. You want to subject yourself to wholesome influences. Amen. If you have a propensity for entertainment, yeah. I wouldn't judge you on it. I'm just saying you got to work on that because that's going to send things to your spirit you don't want there, mm -hmm. and you'll be thinking about. It things that aren't profitable. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen, Philemon. That's, all, that's the way it stands. Now I ask you, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to get a letter like that? Amen. Amen. Well, you did. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we did. We all got this letter. Yes, and now you, in your wisdom, mm -hmm. you can adapt it yes. to your situation. And do you have a word you'd like to add tonight for the sister Barb? I was considering what you mentioned about hospitality and this, this being an area where we can pour our faith into our life. Mm -hmm. And what a mercy of the Lord that is, on the one hand, for us to have an expression in, in this fleshly life that we are living in, to have something we can pour our faith in to be productive. Mm -hmm. It's very satisfying when we have something like this mm -hmm. to pour our faith in and to see the effects of it in in the fleshly life. Amen. But on the Amen. other hand, it's it's profitable for those who receive it as well. Mm -hmm. If you are in a situation where you receive of the good oh, works yeah. of a man, mm -hmm. sometimes you receive it with <coughs> thankfulness, but it's not the same as when you receive the same works from a person with That's faith. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's, there's more to it when the person with faith adds their faith to the action. Amen. So yeah. that we actually receive more from it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And this is also an area where we can stir one another on to love and good works. That's in this, right. In this area of, of hospitality, you know, there may be things that maybe we didn't think about on our own, but then when we received yeah. hospitality mm -hmm. from the body, mm -hmm. then we're able then to reciprocate that maybe to another part of the body. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, we Yeah, I, I fear that many people that call themselves religious, they don't, they couldn't find a place for what you just said because they've received another spirit, yeah. mm -hmm. another gospel, and another mm -hmm. Jesus that that it's like that doesn't they're not even able to process like what what are you talking about because they don't have yeah. the resources you yeah. talk about but about, about, uh, the, the grace being with their spirit grace yeah. can't be with their spirit it can't because they've received another one and one that that doesn't need the fellowship of saints doesn't need to, to assemble they, they don't need grace from God because the things that they're asking for yeah. or wanting don't require grace yeah they have another spirit yeah mm -hmm. so I mean if you're gonna do the work of the Lord you have got to have his grace to do it amen this Jason yeah. yeah I don't think that I don't think most people in church understand really what grace is yeah that's right uh, and that's that's unfortunate because it's like a basic Bible word, but it's been re, kind of redefined. Like love has been redefined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like when people say great grace, they think of like tolerance or or being nice or being easy on somebody. Give them grace, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't be hard on them. Give them grace. Mm -hmm. But but in the New Testament, grace <laughs> grace doesn't really mean that at all. Grace. Grace brings something to you. Yes. You have something by 
grace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or it does something in you yes, or amen. through you. Mm -hmm. That's grace. We're, we're saved by, by grace. grace. Amen. Mm -hmm. Salvation comes by grace. It brings something to you. Or it, Paul said, I labored more abundantly than them all, all the other apostles, not I, yet the grace, grace. of God that mm -hmm. was in me. So, you know, this. there's a Christian leader in Joplin that said the Word of Truth Fellowship doesn't have any grace. Mm -hmm. This was actually said. What? That's because he doesn't know what grace is, for yeah. starters, and he doesn't know anything about the word truth fellowship. Yeah. So you kind of have to let that go. But but that's a common. <coughs> if if someone perceives that you're intolerant or that you're strict, see mm -hmm. that's that you don't have any grace. You don't have any grace. Yeah. But see, that's that's not what this means. He wasn't praying. It's, he didn't say. <coughs> May the tolerance of the Lord Jesus be with you. Yeah. That isn't what he said. It's, yeah. What he's praying for is like, may the Lord, it's like a blessing. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm praying that Jesus would give you something. Mm -hmm. Or that he would do something mm -hmm. in your life. That mm -hmm. That's what grace is. It's, I understand that the dominant concept of grace is favor. Which it means it's something God wants to do, is inclined to do, mm -hmm. loves to do. Yeah. It's his favor. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't have this kind of favor yeah. toward mankind as he was. Uh -huh. So that's what that was through the necessity of redemption and salvation that so that he could make man mm -hmm. so he could actually have bestow favor preference yeah, right. preference uh -huh. grace is God's divine preference uh -huh. Uh -huh. which means nothing can interfere with it Amen. 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 if God wants to do it uh -huh. like who can who can stay his hand right. so when the favor of God rests upon you there's going to be it's like a great big funnel Focuses the benefits of God toward you because God, God likes you. Quite frankly, He likes you. Yes, amen. Jesus said to His disciples, "The Father loves you mm -hmm. because you love Me and yeah. believed I came out from God." Amen. Yeah. That's that's God's yeah. grace. Amen. God doesn't show grace on people that chafe against His Spirit. That's right. If you would labor to be acceptable in his sight, to avail yourself of all the provisionaries that are realized in Christ, his favor will ab actually yes. abound Amen. towards you because of your attitude toward Christ. Yes. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Any others tonight? Yes, Anna. Um, if you have a life in Christ, it is totally different from than those who live in the world. Mm -hmm. So you can't live in Christ and be of the world. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. Emma. Mm -hmm. I love to hear these <laughs> make these observations that a lot of people can't make when they're old. Yeah. With Ricky. Yeah, the purpose of salvation is that God would be glorified. That's right. His people have I formed for myself that I may be glorified. That's right. And uh but God's glorified when what He puts in you comes out. Mm -hmm. That's right. When it's Amen. expressed in your body. Now, all these various relationships you talked about at the opening, um, like a husband and wife relationship or a relationship between a, a, uh, a master and a slave, mm -hmm. that relationship, a relationship between father and mother to children, all of these are areas where, where we have this kind of association with God directly. You know, he's yes, a father amen. in us, and we are his children. Amen. He is the Lord. See, and we are his people. Or the Christ is the mm. bridegroom, and, and we're, the, we're the bride. See, but all of those relationships become an opportunity for Christ to be magnified. Amen. So as we mm -hmm. give ourselves to those things by faith, then it becomes an opportunity for he that is unseen to be seen through his people yeah. mm -hmm. as they use the seen this body that they've been given to express that life. See, with, mm -hmm. Without those associations which he originated, we couldn't understand mm -hmm. his relationship to you to the redeemed. We couldn't comprehend it, so he embedded it in a type yeah. 
in the relationships that we have some understanding of, but that is a, that understanding is like the border of the garment of this deeper identity with God. Yeah. All right. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Philemon and the wonderful things that it has brought to us. We ask that you help us to ponder them often and make profitable associations concerning our own lives. We thank you for Brother Paul. We thank you for Brother Philemon, for Brother Onesimus, and for these other brethren that have been mentioned tonight. We want Heavenly Father to be in the written in the same book as they are now written. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.